Summertime in the south, sunshine and high temperatures. It gets hot. In July, the weather forecast is usually a carbon copy from day to day. High humidity and high heat makes it almost unbearable. And that holds more true for people on a bicycle, especially casual cyclists. Anytime you can dehydrate to death in the shade, it's probably going to be miserable for bike riding. Think about commuting in these kind of temperatures. I used to commute to work during the summer and I would arrive soaking wet and I was only a couple of miles from my house. It's a big problem, but there is a cure. An e-bike can lessen the load and bring back the joy, even on hot days. And that's why I've decided to make this the first Kev Central e-bike week. I know there are feelings on both sides as far as e-bikes go, but there really shouldn't be. Because e-bikes, well, they're here to stay, and now they've become mainstream. It's common now that I see other people on e-bikes when I'm out riding, and I live in a small town. And two years ago, the local bike shop, it was an anomaly to see an e-bike there, and today, they stock multiple. Even high-end Trek full suspension e-bikes. And recently, even the die-hard regular trail riders, they're talking about an e-bike. So I guess that's a problem for the people that vehemently reject the idea because they've arrived and it's only going to grow. Because even Walmart, their e-bike lineup is expanding. They know there's an evolution happening in the cycling world. Last week I published a poll asking which of my current e-bikes did you want to see a follow-up video on first. And to my surprise, the Event and Pace 500 was a landslide winner. That doesn't make sense because I look at analytics all the time and the analytics for the Pace 500 video, well, they're on the low side of my average views. Also, even the audience engagement, while good, it isn't quite as high as my other e-bikes. Let's compare it to the Electric XP, a bike that I reviewed about two weeks earlier. Clearly has more views, but the more telling numbers are the comments and the likes because those are all gained in the first 48 hours and then it rapidly tapers off. Look at my Anchor e-bike review. I mean, sure it's older, but look at that engagement. Now add to that the fact that I'm asked daily about the Electric XP and frequently about the Anchor. But I'm rarely asked about the Pace 500. I mean, it's a great bike, don't get me wrong, but it's just curious. How can it be more popular in a poll? When I line up every other metric, it comes in a distant third. And even in the comments on the poll, the one that the Event and Pace won overwhelmingly, there's none about the Pace. People are asking about the Electric XP and about the Anchor. And in those comments was a better option. One submitted by Rick S., who suggested that I do video on all of them, arranged by price, from lowest to highest. I mean, this is an affordable bike channel. Plus, I was planning on making a video on all the bikes anyway, so let's run with his suggestion and kick off Bike Week with the lowest priced e-bike I have available, the Anchor Power Plus which also happens to be a bike that I'm asked to follow up on regularly. In short, the Anchor's doing well. Now admittedly, I rode this a lot for a month or so, then it gained eight pounds, so I tapered down on the Anchor excursions. But it does have enough charge cycles and enough miles on it to get a good idea how it's gonna hold up, or at least enough time for any shortcomings to attract my attention. And I decided for the ride footage on this video, I was gonna start from a full charge and use throttle only. In my previous video, which you should watch first if you haven't already seen it, or maybe if you have seen it, you want to go back and recap to get up to speed, a link down in the description, or maybe it's sliding across your screen depending upon your device. In that video, I covered all the details of the bike, so I'm not going to go over them here, but today's footage is about the ride, because I want you to get an idea of the battery life and the performance under a max load, so that's throttle only. And I'm on the same TVA trail I used for the Pace 500 video a few weeks ago, where the rigid fork and the 28 miles per hour rattled me around a bit. But the Anchor has a suspension fork, albeit a very low-end big box suspension fork, but even that can make a difference. The Power Plus also has a lower top speed, 16 to 18 miles per hour, compared to the 28 of the Pace, that's 10 less, so that'll smooth it out even more. I know this bike well, it was my first e-bike, so I spent quite a bit of time on it when I first got it, and it has four modes, three pedal assist modes and then the throttle only mode. And while I've used them all, I rarely go into low. It's kind of like driving on the interstate doing 45. It just doesn't make sense. Honestly, I can't even remember the last time I really used medium, except when I was low on battery and I didn't think I was going to make it back. It's usually high mode, throttle only, or a combo of the two. So how are the ranges after all this time? Well, in low, I get about 28 miles. 20-ish for medium, and down to about 14 for high. Throttle only, I've never ridden until the battery died, but I will be doing that for this video. But before I get to that, let me talk about the power. This is a 36 volt, 250 watt, and that's enough to have fun, but not enough to go crazy. And torque wise, it's on the low side, but still very usable. Now on hills, 250 watts is gonna rapidly run down and require an assist, but going down hills, it's a great free rolling bicycle. I can hit in the high 20s just by coasting down, so there's not much motor drag. 
Now throttle only can climb some slight elevation changes, but going up big hills, like I said, it's going to require some help. Which is really the only time I shift a bike, and that's when I have to help it power up hills, and even then, it's a pedal assist bike, so even on steep hills, it's still a cakewalk. It's like pedaling on flat ground, but just happen to be going uphill. Inclines, they never show up well on camera, but this one's a killer, and I'm easily going up it. This one's followed by an even steeper hill that, I'm not ashamed to admit, I've probably pushed up more times than I've ridden up. Back to that fork for just a second. Here you can see it's making easy work of the same rough asphalt that rattled me around so much with the rigid fork on the pace. I can even venture onto the river's edge gravel path without being jolted around up front. And also, speaking about the fork, let me say that there are two people that contacted me that have anterior bikes and asked if my fork juddered when bringing the bike to a stop because theirs did. And two things immediately come to my mind, and the first is that maybe the headset's loose. Because the bike ships with a stem off the steer, so if you don't know how much pressure to put there and you have it loose, well that can cause a judder. And the second is that cheap forks like this can have play between the stanchions and the fork tube. So I tried to duplicate the problem, and I found that if I brake heavily using only the front brake, I mean dangerously heavy, I can feel just a slight bit of judder. I'm also wondering if those that are mentioning the problem are accidentally grabbing the wrong brake lever. Because remember, this isn't a US spec bike brake lever wise, so the right brake is actually the front. So let's go over the bike and talk about my experience with it and look at it component by component and we'll start with the frame. This isn't a big bike, it's a 26 inch wheel set with a 16 and a half to 17 inch frame. So even with the saddle at peak height, if this weren't an e-bike, my knees would be complaining. The bars are just about right, not too narrow, not too wide. Now the grips, they're on the hard side, and I know a thing or two about hard grips because I have trigger finger in my thumb, thanks to hard grips, you'll hear more about that soon. All the control points have continued to work fine, the throttle doesn't bind, still springs back perfectly, and I've used it a lot, and the light switch still works great, the horn too. And those bottom end Shimano Mickey Mouse shifters, they haven't given me any trouble, but I don't even use the left one, I think this bike would have been better as a one by. Electric drive-wise, the computer, it's no frills and no problems. It's super simple, and that's effective on a cheaper bike, and the flicker here you see is due to the camera. A side note here is I'm asked a lot about this bike make computer. This isn't part of the anterior bike package. I added this so I'd have a speedometer. And the SRBR rainbow wheels, these have held their true and worked out great. So have the tires for city streets, gravel roads, and yards. And wider tires will fit both up front and at the back for whatever reason. I've been asked this multiple times. And the Wogo pedals, there's not a lot of pressure or need for traction on e-bike pedals, so use these until they wear out and 3 by whatever. It does have a tourney up front, but it rarely has to do any work. The tourney in the back though, that does, or at least on hills, but it's usually only moving maybe 3 or 4 gears at any point. The water bottle battery, not so stylish in 2019, but after 8 plus months, it still gives the same output from ride to ride, and that's even with it sitting sometimes for long periods between uses. Those Filel mechanical disc brakes, they're usable, but the front's starting to bake and the rear, those pads are already cooked. $10 for better quality replacements that should last longer. And this cadence sensor, I have no idea how many magnets are in it, but I have a few e-bikes now and I can say that this works acceptably well, but it's not as good as my other e-bikes, but we're talking about fractions of a second. Speed controllers in this black box, and on cheap kits, that burns out a lot, overheats itself, but I don't feel a lot of heat coming from this controller box. Cabling is all external. It's cleanly routed, though I will probably put some sheathing on it, most specifically down at the bottom bracket. 250 watts, 8 plus months, and no problems. It hasn't gotten any louder either. That's another complaint I've read about some of those cheap motor kits. This one's still running great. The seats, as one would expect, it's better than nothing, but it does get uncomfortable on long rides. What about that throttle only range I was talking about? Now the only pedaling I did on this ride was on the few hills to give it a slight assist. I even worked it up some hills with throttle only, more so than I normally would. This was on a full charge. I thought I planned this well, but only almost well, because I was three miles from making it back when the low power cutoff kicked in. That was right as the odometer clicked over to 10.6 miles. So the range on a full charge going throttle only, about 10 and a half miles. So here's the list of the ranges as I'm pretty much averaging them and I'm rounding these down. So throttle only at 10, low around 28, medium around 20, and high about 14. And this is a good opportunity to answer the question of how does this bike ride as a bike with no power? Because the bike weighs 47.6 pounds and with no pedal assist it feels pretty much exactly like a standard big box bike. It's a little shocking that it's practically identical to any other 21 speed bike you'd buy at Walmart. I guess that's good. 
eight plus months, no major problems. And these forks, any of these cheap forks, can have a little bit of judder if you break heavy on them. But I think I have an idea of how I can make this one slightly better. I'll cover that in an upcoming video. Overall, for a $615 e-bike, this has been better than I could have expected. And I'm happy with the performance for what it is. And that's a cheap e-bike. One note here, and this is an important note, and this came from a guy that sells $4,000 e-bikes who once told me with e-bikes it's not a question of when they're going to break, it's how fast. And the cheap ones are going to break a lot faster, but the golden question is, how much less will this last than a better bike to make up for that price difference? And on top of that, there are bikes in 2019 that for just a bit more have better visual quality, better components, and again, don't cost that much more, like the Electric XP and even a Schwinn that you're going to see coming up here later this week. Which is yet another important point, that Schwinn name, the electric name, the event name, they all have US-based support. And that's a segue to me telling you about my experience with Anchir. They contacted me about reviewing their bike, and whenever anyone contacts me about reviewing a bike, and I don't know that brand, I have a barrage of questions. They answered every question and did so quickly. And I was thrilled with their apparent commitment to their product, so I decided to review the bike. And they emailed me after I published the review. They were happy with it and happy that I liked the bike, and that was good news to me. About three months later, I wanted to do a follow-up review, but I noticed the bike was out of stock on Amazon, and I wanted the follow-up to coincide with the bike that was actually available, so I reached out to find out when they were going to restock. And I never received a response, and I've tried multiple times since then, and I've never heard from them. Now, it could be that my contact is no longer with the company, but it's something to note. I've had two others in the past few months that weren't thrilled with the communication they had with Anchir after their purchase, so I want to be transparent because all this needs to be factored in. That said, aside from fork judder, I haven't had anyone mention any issues they've had with their Anchir bike, only communication problems and slow shipping. And note that the slow shipping wasn't through Amazon, that was someone that ordered directly from the Anchir website. So in summary, the bike still works well, and I'm happy with the battery life and with the performance of it. I mean, for what it is, it's a pretty decent bike in my opinion. The only thing I need to do to it is put new brake pads on it, and I'm going to experiment around with the fork, but that's just for fun. Hopefully Anchor will see this and reach back out to me, because I'd like to have a reliable contact in case subscribers have questions. Going into this, I had questions about any of these marketplace, be it Walmart, Amazon, or anywhere else e-bikes, but I feel better about them now, thanks to this Anchor, because I really do like it. Is it the best e-bike I have? Not by a long shot. Would I save more and buy something like the Electric XP? Absolutely. But it's important to note that anyone shopping for any of these, that they're basically a big box bike, say about a $200 big box bike, with the basic e-bike kit installed on it. Now that's a factory installed kit, and they do a good job. I mean, the evidence of that is that this is still going. I can't wait to see how many more miles I can run up on the Anchor Power Plus. And that's the kickoff to e-bike week here on Kev Central. So stay tuned, be subscribed, and check the notification bell, because I think you're probably going to want to see the next video. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.